Good afternoon, <laughs> members, officers, and um, any members who are viewing live stream and also residents who are viewing live stream this meeting. Welcome to today's meeting of the Climate Change and Environment Advisory Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm chair of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. Um, and for the information for members of the public, our committee advises cabinet on the actions required to achieve the council's targets on climate change and its environmental commitments. So holding them to account, but also helping shape that same policy. Um, so anybody present in the council chamber, can you make sure everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, it's, going, it's likely to be broadcast or visible at any point, so just be aware of that. The camera follows the microphone being switched on. Um, so please, councillors and officers, please wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up and, and bring you into the spotlight. And anybody participating in the meeting, hello, and please just show in the chat if you want to speak. Um, and make sure that when you do speak, you have any other mobile devices switched off. And please use a headset when speaking, if possible, and hold the microphone close to your mouth. So when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that your microphone is switched on, and when you've finished, switch it off immediately. Um, please note, if you need to vote on any item, we shall do so via the microphones of those present in the meeting only. So I'll invite everybody now to introduce themselves. As I said, my name is Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm the chair, and I have my vice chair. Hello, my name is Councillor Martin Khan. Uh, I represent Piston and People in Northrop Park, and I'm the vice chair. Thank you. And my other vice chair? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey, I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Paul Bearpark? Hello, I'm Paul Bearpark. I'm district councillor for Milton and Water Beach. Thank you. And um, we don't have any other councillors. Councillor Sue Ellington, uh, uh, standing in for Councillor Cohn. Thank you very much. And are there any other members present online? No, I don't think so. Um, but I can confirm that the meeting is quorum, even though we are a select group, <laughs> because quorum is three members. Um, and I will also now like to invite um, officers who are with us. And very, very happy to have with us for the first time um, Bode Isan, who is with us in the chamber and who is our new head of environmental um, services. So it's wonderful to have you with us. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, but also a couple of words as well. We're very excited to have you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hellings. It's a great pleasure for me to finally hear on the ground. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to working with the entire council and with the councils really looking to help uh, further ensure that our services excel in the way we deliver our services for the environment, for waste, and for climate change. So thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thank you very much. And we'd just like to know that, you know, fascinating CV in terms of your work experience as well, which is both, you know, in the UK and internationally, both on waste, but also on green energy investment and turning a whole area green, you know, working together with businesses and partnerships. So we're very, very excited to have you with us thank you very much that, that's very good and also i think online do i have with us john cornell good afternoon yes i'm here and i appreciate your good I, I decided to be here. yes i do i just want to say who you are john so oh, yes okay. Lovely and good. And heading up your team as well, Jane. Lovely. Thank you. Great to have you with us as well. And we have with us also Soraya Hashimi. Lovely to see you too, Soraya, and we're, we've got a big issue on the table in the agenda, so it's great to, great to have you with us around air quality, so that's fantastic. And Siobhan, we have you with us as well. Good afternoon, members. Good afternoon, colleagues, and particularly, very, very nice to see you. 
Thank you. And Rebecca. And also have John Gibson, is that right? Or Peter. Peter Gibson, sorry. Peter. Oh, Peter from Air Quality. Peter. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Lovely to have both you and Soraya here, especially as we're going to be dealing with the air quality issues. That's fantastic. Good. Thank you, everybody. Um, and um, do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair. We have apologies from uh, Graham Cohn. And I'm happy to say that uh, we have Sue Ellington uh, in substitute for Graham Cohn and also Grenville Chamberlain has given us apologies. Good. Thank you. And I know also that Councillor Peter Fain isn't with us, but we haven't heard anything from him so far. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so, members, with that, we can go um, now into item number... Oh, hello. And we, I see that we've also, just as we're coming, starting the meeting. So, Bridget, lovely to see you. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Lovely. And also lead cabinet member for climate and environment. So it's really, really good to have you with us, Bridget, you know, during these meetings as well, which is great. Um, so on to declarations of interest. Um, do any members have any interest to declare on these items of the agenda with us? Councillor Khan? Um, we were discussing the solar, the, the solar together scheme. Um, I've been a candidate, uh, a client of that scheme. Oh. Right. Thank you very much. We'll be interested to hear about your experience on that. Well, very good. Good, and now we'll turn to item number three, which are minutes of the previous meeting, um, which on page one of our agenda pack. Do I have any comments on the minutes? Yes, go on. Um, just a correction on number eight, item eight. Um, we talked about, um, I mentioned sulfur hexafluoride, and it was mm -hmm. minutes of this fluoride. So it's ah, yes. sulfur hexafluoride, the strongest greenhouse gas, 29,000 times stronger than carbon dioxide. So we better get used to spelling that one. <laughs> Thank you, and that's well noted. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and now we go to the substantive items on the agenda, um, and we're starting um, agenda item four, which are plans for Ouse, Fen, and Fendrayton nature reserves. And we have Hannah Phillips with us, the RSPB area manager. Hello, Hannah. It's lovely to have you, have you there with us. And this is a really important item, members. As we've just seen the preferred options for the local plan go out with the green infrastructure study as part of that, we're often seen as a little bit of the Cinderella you know, of the greater Cambridgeshire area in terms of um, biodiversity, environment, you know, designated areas, but we all know that there are some really, really key fragments and areas that, that are very precious to all of us and that we're keen on um, making more visible and known and of more value and also working with partners to increase those areas and decrease their biodiversity, which is why we're fascinated to hear about what's been happening with the use Ben Hanna. So please go ahead. Yes, we can now, Hannah. Thank you. That's
Hannah, just sorry, sorry, and I don't because we don't want to miss any of this. We've just got a bit of a problem with the live streaming. So if you just hold on a minute, we're just going to try and reset it and then we'll pick up. And then we really want, do want to know that in South Cams, we're part of one of these restored landscapes that would be the biggest in Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> that really turns things on its head. Can you, you've just stopped presenting for a moment. Hannah, if you take down the shared screen. Thanks for your patience, Hannah. <laughs> We're just sorting it. No. Did you hear, can I just ask you, so Hannah, did you hear the song of the reed on Radio 4?
can you speak just now? So we're testing this. Hopefully that's working. Can you try again, Hannah? Just to yes, we're working now, so that's oh, brilliant. I can actually hear an echo, but let, let's carry on. We we can't hear the echo, so that's fine. Um, if you just want to take us to that first slide, is that okay? Yes. Do you want me to start from the beginning? Um, the next slide, yeah. Uh, to Uzven. Yeah. There we go. Yes. There we go. So, this is um, uh, our project with um, Hansen, which is creating uh, RSPB uh, Uzven. It's currently uh, 300 hectares in size, um, and when it's complete, it'll be uh, 700 hectares in size, making it the biggest restoration um, of its type uh, in Europe and containing uh, Britain's biggest weed bed. Um, and this map here on the left shows you the progress to date with the restoration. So apologies that the numbers on the cells are quite small, but you can see areas one through to nine have been handed over already to the RSPB and are part of the nature reserve. And then we've got cells 10 through to um, 16, which are due to be um, transferred over um, following the completion of quarrying between now and about um, 2031. So um, as well as being really important in a, in a local context, this site will be one of the um, most important wetlands um, in a UK context as well. And is certainly um, one of the biggest sort of projects um, of its, of its um, size uh, and scope. And as well as being really important for nature, um, it's also um, providing great opportunities for people to come and connect with nature. Um, and up at the Erith end, we've um, recently uh, opened a new car park, so um, there's hopefully lots of ways for people to come and access um, uh, and enjoy the reserve. For those of you who have not been to the site, hopefully the video is playing and hopefully this will give you a bit of an idea um, of the scale of the site. It's already delivering um, for the key species that were targeted, like bitterns, marsh harriers, um, and we also have um, a pair of common cranes breeding on the site, which is brilliant as that species continues to make its um, comeback across the fens. And inland wetland sites are particularly important in a national context as we see um, the impacts of rising sea levels on um, wetland sites um, around the coast. So we don't see the video anymore. It's not. That's fine. That's it's fine. finished. Okay. Excellent. So thinking about um, Usfen and where there, where there might be opportunities, um, obviously we know that, that the council are aspiring to um, achieve 20% biodiversity net gain. Um, the RSBB are investigating registering the most recently restored 80 hectares um, as a potential net gain site. Um, and we have approximately 300 hectares more to restore and be managed by the RSPB between now um, and 2031. Um, and within the uh, minerals plan, there is also the potential for a further 100 hectare extension um, to, to the site um, as well. And I think um, with use Fen, with net gain, we're obviously still waiting to see what, what detail comes through um, with the legislation. Um, but we really want to see biodiversity net gain delivering really high quality habitats for nature. And I think with a site like Use Fen, we can really demonstrate what is um, what is possible um, to achieve and with the potential for um, delivery of more habitat and with net gain as a potential um, funding source to help secure that habitat and also secure um, ongoing management of that habitat. So I've, I've spoken a bit today already about um, habitat creation and improvement, but I thought it's really also important to acknowledge um, how important nature is for people and communities too. Um, so this slide shows some statistics from a recent RSPB Commission report, which was looking into people's attitudes towards nature during the coronavirus crisis in England. 
Um, and the report, you know, really showed a lot of things that, that we know to be true, um, that people um, really value the importance of nature and, um, and access to green space. So the report found that 89% of people agreed that increasing the amount of nature-rich green space would improve health, well-being and happiness. And when you consider that Cambridgeshire has one of the lowest proportions of habitat for nature in the UK, these results are particularly brought into focus. Um, as well as the importance of nature for people, the report also highlighted some of the large inequities that we see in how people are able to access nature, with poorer households being over three times more likely to have absolutely no outdoor green space um, where they live. So this is one of the maps from the Greater Cambridgeshire Green Infrastructure Opportunity Mapping Project. Um, and you can see up here we've got um, Ouse Fen uh, and Fen and Lakes. So hopefully some um, really nice uh, overlap with some of the opportunities um, uh, from that um, project, with the most relevant layers being biodiversity, landscape, water um, and recreation. So hopefully there is good overlap here with strategic opportunities for delivering the green infrastructure needs of the local authority and both Fendrate and Lake Zanus Fen sit within that Great Ouse Fenland Arc um, identified priority area um, as well and I particularly like this quote um, which was um, published as part of the report and I promise it wasn't RSPB that submitted this so it's always nice when somebody else says something nice about your nature reserves so our wetlands whether rivers lakes or fen these define our sense of place our relationship with wildlife and our vulnerability to climate change. They are the biggest magnet in Cambridgeshire, from punting along the backs in Cambridge to Fendrated Lakes or Falmere. And yes, I couldn't agree more. So we know that we want to see an increase in the amount of nature-rich green space, and we also want to improve access to existing green space. So this is Fendrated Lakes. Um, it's another ex-mineral site that's been returned to nature and it is the uh, only RSPB nature reserve in the UK to have its own guided busway stop, which um, I always find particularly um, exciting and I'm proud of. And it's also really well served by lots of public access routes. So here we're developing plans to improve the site for visitors uh, and improve the, the, the um, facilities that we have on offer there. And we know that green space in the area is under increasing pressure. Sites are busy and they are sites set to get more busy with the scale of development and housing plans. So improving facilities here will really help contribute, we believe, to that strategic need and also take, help to take the pressure off um, some of our more sensitive sites, uh, particularly in the county. So we, we estimate that the site could be capable of supporting upwards of 80,000 visits per year. But at the moment, the facilities are um, extremely limited and the site really isn't reaching its potential. So what do we need to do to improve the green space offer at Fendrayton Lakes? Well, first, we want to improve the access. Um, for any of you that have visited the site, you'll know um, that if you're driving by car, you actually have to cross the guided busway to get into the car park, which is not ideal. So ideal, ideally, we'd like to relocate the car park and increase its capacity. Um, we'd also need to improve the access road and bridge so that it's suitable for supporting the number of visits that the site is potentially capable of. And to encourage greener means of transport, we're already well served by the existing busway and, um, the, and the accompanying cycle route. But we would like to explore whether we can make a link um, linked up cycle route between Fendrayton Lakes and Lewes Fen to improve the connectivity between those two sites. Um, and all the infrastructure works will need to be supported by a flood risk assessment. Um, the site sits within the floodplain and the site is floods regularly in winter. So for example, it's probable that land raising might be required in some areas to mitigate for flooding um, and to ensure that any facilities we put in place um, are, are resilient for that flooding. But we also want to improve the experience for people that visit the site and um, really um, help improve um, access to nature. For example, through things like wild play, 
um, active experiences like biking, kayaking, and maybe even potentially swimming. Um, exactly what will be delivered will be informed by development work um, and consultation, but hopefully these images help to conjure up um, the art of the possible. And you know, we'd also like to hear from you if you have any ideas for um, what you would like um, these sites to particularly deliver. So we've already made a pretty good start on the development work using some internal staff resource, but it is going to be the case that external investment will be needed to help realise the potential of the reserve. Um, so these are some figures that we submitted as part of a um, Section 106 uh, request for contribution, contributions from the North Stowe development, given how closely um, located um, Fendraken Lakes is to that development and given that we expect um, a visitor uplift as a result of that development. So these figures are, are very provisional as we need to complete development work um, to understand the um, and determine the scope of any infrastructure needed. But hopefully it will give you a bit of an idea of the um, scale of investment that's um, likely to be necessary. Um, before I finish, I also wanted to briefly um, talk about Falmir. Um, which is another uh, RSPB site that we have um, in the south of the county. And uh, many of you will be very aware of the issues that are currently affecting our chalk streams. Um, and Falmir, a um, uh, site of special scientific interest, is particularly affected. The site is supplied by water from um, chalk springs, and the river Shep runs through the site. Um, lack of water supply to the wetland can cause significant issues, uh, as you can see in this picture. So this is a reed bed, um, but it doesn't actually have uh, any water in it, apart from that tiny pool um, in the middle there that you can just about see. Um, and it is only thanks to pumping uh, from the Environment Agency that the site has not completely dried out in recent uh, years. So. Over the next few years, we have plans to undertake work to improve our ability to store and move water around the site, um, as well as supporting advocacy efforts to address those underlying issues of unsustainable water use and abstraction within the catchment. And we are particularly grateful um, to the Council for your, for your leadership on this particular issue. So we're hoping to apply for pre-planning soon to enable us to undertake the works on site to improve the resilience of the site. This will include uh, installing some additional water control structures um, alongside creation um, of new wet features and um, deepening some of the channels that we already have on site. And this is all with the aim of improving how we can um, store and move water around the site, which should help the site um, cope better with some of the water shortages that we have seen, although um, it's important that alongside that mitigation work we continue um, with uh, measures to um, address the uh, underlying cause. I also briefly wanted to mention some of the work that we're doing outside of our nature reserves. So we are very lucky to have our own arable farm um, at Knapwell in Cambridgeshire. Um, Hope Farm is used to demonstrate wildlife friendly farming techniques in a productive farm setting. So as well as producing food and benefiting nature, it's used as a pilot site for RSPB research. For example, at the moment we have a new agroforestry trial um, which has begun on site this year, growing um, trees alongside um, uh, arable crops. And outside of our nature reserves, we also work very closely with landowners to provide advice uh, on nature-friendly farming. We have a particular focus on turtle doves um, in the county. Turtle doves has the unfortunate claim of being the fastest declining bird in the UK, but we do have um, remaining core populations um, in the local area, and we're working with farmers in an effort to boost their numbers. This includes providing supplementary seed and advice about management. And just this year, there's been a nationwide survey of turtle doves this spring, which will hopefully help in future um, for us to further um, target our efforts. And um, I'm going to um, leave it there, I think. But um, thank you very much. And uh, that's my contact details there. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about our work today. 
Thank you so much, Hannah. That's that's fantastic. And you know, as you said, the first biodiversity opportunity mapping that was done, you know, for the for the council confirmed the fact that we are one of the lowest areas in in the country, or the highest in terms of deficit of land managed for wildlife that then is accessible to to people. And so. These initiatives are huge, and, and I had no idea that you know that the eventual size of the Inspen and you know and that importance that's huge, and and it's it is good to hear about things like the Section 106 you know arrangements they are they're starting to do, and we can see um, how that how that can support. But I'd like to throw it open to any questions now. I have a couple, but anybody from the committee? Yes, Councillor Sua, you can. Hello. Hello, Hannah. Um, this is my patch. I'm the district councillor for Fendrayton and Swavesey, and I haven't heard of any of these things either. And I would very strongly suggest that cooperation and support from my two parish councils would be a really good idea. I met Chris and Tim for the first time last week, and we talked about byways. But I think um, there is so much that the villagers would love to get involved with. Um, and I think their support would be very helpful towards the whole project. Um, and particularly, um, I'm concerned around um, the car park, the access road, even in my 4x4 is um, a bit, uh, yes. Um, and I think we really could work much more cooperatively together, especially as I've got planings and a machine to make my byways work, and that would do a wonderful job on your access road. <laughs> <laughs> Love this that's too. That's absolutely what we, you know, what we need to hear, which is how we yes. can seriously work together. And and this is the one of the things we were talking about with um, with Siobhan and Rebecca is the fact that we're not shouting out more about what we have, and when we don't shout about it more, as I said, we're the Cinderella in the wider area. So where things can go, because there's not a lot there, so you're not going to lose very much over there. Actually, it's about shouting about what we need and what we do have. So. And I, because I'm at the other end of the guided busway, I go there a lot. <laughs> so I love this and know about it. But um, that's fantastic. Hannah, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, no, that, that's just fantastic to hear. And, and I also, you know, very we, we are at the very early days of scoping, particularly the, the work at Fendrayton. And we, we want to create something that the local community want. We don't want to create something. We don't want to come up with something in isolation and impose it. We want it to be co-created and we want to deliver what the local community really want from, from their green space. So yeah, we're, we're really keen to, to, work, to work with you and to, and to you know, really do that community consultation well. Can I come back? I think it would be useful if we uh, sent emails to each other and, and set that up. Um, yep. And I've got parish council meetings in the next uh, couple of weeks at which I will raise it and ensure that uh, um, we all form some sort of uh, useful group to help. Swavesey and Fendrayton don't talk to each other an awful lot, you understand, so it might have to be two separate meetings. That's and wonderful, thank you. Good, and I think also learning from the FENS biosphere that we're, you know, as a council, we're championing that with other councils. And what, and I think this is really important to what you're saying is, if communities hear about it in the wrong way, they can get very protective. And when they hear about car parks, it's immediately the wrong assumption, you know? And when you talk about access to nature and then you're talking about a car park. And so I think getting in these really early relationships and conversations is critical um, that would be good um, do any other Sue? one other thought and that is that there are one or two farmers around there that it would be well worth me introducing you to 
because, again, they play a significant role, um, particularly as one has quite a significant pheasant shoot. That would be really useful, and I think I think particularly farmers that are adjacent to existing um, nature reserves, they, I mean, there are there are opportunities for all farmers to contribute, but but strategically those those are of particular interest um, because you know you, they've got a real opportunity to complement what's being delivered um, on the on the site. Good, and Captain Jeff Harvey. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. I, I'd just be really quite interested to know. Um, your experiences of um, uh, using biodiversity net gain as a, as a sort of funding stream to enable some of these projects, and that could be, you know, a, a system that would be obviously could be copied in other parts of um, South Cambridgeshire. How, how have you found that in terms of, you know, is that a functioning market? How do you make contact with people who might want to acquire sort of credit, if you like? Um, thank you. Yeah, it's something that RSPB are. Um, are at the very early stages of of um, of looking at as as a means of funding. So there are there are examples um, where we've done it in other counties, but that's tended to be using um, Section 106, for example. So there's an example in um, Devon where Section 106 contributions have been used to create um, habitat for um, cell buntings, um, and that's been a strategic approach um, with the council there. But in terms of um, yeah, the next steps, we're we're waiting to see what the legislation does, and we're waiting to sort of determine our own organisational position a little bit on 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 how we sort of tread carefully and engage with biodiversity net gain. But I think you know the absolute priority for us is that is that you know net net gain is coming, um, and we want to make sure that it delivers really high quality nature rich habitats because um there is an opportunity to do it well and there's also an opportunity to do it less well um and we want to see it really delivering the gains that we need for nature so i think that's a, an area where we could thanks jeff for that really good question because i think that's an area where we could look at some good partnerships and some learning perhaps formally you know as a partnership and i'm looking at um Bridget as well, this is something that we, we could think about, is um, we also want to, as you saw, our aspiration is not 10% biodiversity net gain, which is probably going to come through the legislation, but to set 20%. Most people, ecologists have said that 10% is within the margin of error on a, on a development. So you, you, you might get it, you might not, but you wouldn't really, it doesn't really make much difference. Whereas 20% is quite challenging and therefore is worth doing. Obviously, what we're seeing in terms of the mitigation hierarchy is that, first of all, it's not doing any harm. <laughs> that's, that's what you try and do, first of all. And then you try and enhance the biodiversity on site. And then, if you can't, you look at something off site. Now, all of the mapping that's being done for our local plan is identifying the opportunity areas for where that would happen. And what I would like for our committee to recommend, and it's lovely to have Jane Green and John Connell on the call, is that we, in that mapping, we look at South Cams, and there are, this, my question is about the Nature Recovery Network for Cambridge, doesn't highlight these opportunity areas that the wider map does. So the wider map focuses on other opportunity areas, which are more around sort of the Magog um, areas down on that side, you know, rather than this. So not all maps have this opportunity area that you showed on your map, which is the Ewes Fen, and even the, the area between the Ewes Fen and the Wickham Fen. So those are not identified on the maps. So by shouting about it more, by getting more information about it, more value, you know, that these are potential areas for any trial biodiversity net gain, off-site biodiversity net gain that we might be, be looking at. And I was thinking of one of the ways also that we could get more um, awareness out. And I was talking with Siobhan Mellon, officer, who's on the, on the call um, in the meeting. But we've got, in the build-up to COP26, there are a series of UK-wide and worldwide events. And one of those is the Great Big Green Week. And I wonder whether in the Great Big Green Week, we shout about some of our green areas. You know, and if there's a South Cams magazine or in the newsletter or, or whatever, we get information out to parish councils 
about the areas that we have in, you know, in South Cambridgeshire. Um, but I don't know if that kind of form where we might see about some kind of trialing of something with you, um, but I'd leave that up to the planners as well. But rather than being reactive to this, we've done all the commissioned all the evidence, can we do something together? And I say this because I have read the RSB's latest position on biodiversity in the UK, which is quite critical, and so I understand that. So can we learn together, you know, about doing something? Yeah, absolutely. And I think if, you know, as a next step, perhaps we could put you in touch with um, we could get a few people together with our with our net gain experts to think about what's possible. Councillor Khan. Yeah, um, um, thank you very much indeed for the presentation and also for inviting me to the visit earlier on in the year, which I very much enjoyed seeing, seeing what you were doing on the ground. <clears throat> this is obviously part of, uh, hopefully will be part of the, the larger biosphere reserve proposal and hopefully will be a quite a key area within that. It's also part of the, uh, the Ouse Valley area, which covers into adjoining districts uh, in Huntingdonshire in particular, and in Bedford, um, Bedfordshire. Um, uh, and so I think seeing it as part of a larger thing, um, in particular with your label of being the largest such site in Europe, um, gives it greater warm, uh, warmth and, and get, it makes it easier to get funding. Uh, and I think we do need to think about how we present it. Um, I, uh, it may be seen as unimportant, but it is important in terms of giving it uh, the sort of support that it needs. Uh, uh, and I hope we can negotiate and discuss with the government authorities and other bodies to try and to give us a, a bigger, a bigger uh, uh, forum. Uh, I was also thinking in terms of, I mean, I, I, I hope we can get opportunities through uh, biodiversity net gain and section 106. I think there's real, uh, could be real opportunities there. Uh, at the moment, the whole planning system is up in the air, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, we must keep that in, in mind. Um, but but uh, I, rather, have you looked also at other habitats? I mean, obviously, the, this is a lowland habitat, uh, fen habitats are important, but we've got a lot of, uh, we have got, although not large in area, we've got some interesting woodlands, particular, including one, after all, which is the RSPB uh, um, area, uh, the lodge. You have, uh, you have an interest in woodlands. Uh, um, and there are other woods in, uh, 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 in the Yamla Gays or uh, uh, on the, uh, the West, Eastern Clayland, but also actually on the Essex borderlands. There's uh, some very interesting woods along the border with uh, Essex and Suffolk there, which um, all of which are sort of rather broken and, and would, there will be opportunities for making them larger habitats are generally better, larger units, uh, uh, opportunities for increasing. Have you got? Um, aspirations in, in that sphere, uh, or is it simply a, a matter of resources? Um, <laughs> uh, I would also yeah, well, uh, comment, I, as I understand it, Hope Farm is mainly used for education of farm advisors. Um, um, I had a friend of mine who came and visited uh, Hope Farm about six years ago and stayed with her, um, who's a farm advisor in Wales. Um, so I, I understand she was saying that it's mainly for specialist visits, but, um, but do you see any opportunities for a wider uh, wider, or is it just a wider utilization, okay, or is it too difficult? <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was woodland woodlands and Hope Farm. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you Sorry, ask, if you ask any <laughs> if you ask any nature um, conservation manager in the area, they'll always tell you that they want more. Um, <laughs> we do we do have a particular focus with RSPB on those on on those wetland creation sites, but we also, you know, we are supportive of increasing tree cover particularly, um, you know, in, in a managed way that puts the right tree in the right place. Um, and I think one, in, in relation to woodlands, I think I think one really interesting habitat for us going forward where we haven't done as much work on but we might like to in future would be wet woodland. Um, because with wet woodland, um, I think there are particular opportunities when you look at things like flood storage as well. So, um, and, and we know that... Uh, Quite a lot of the wet woodland in the lowlands has been lost. Um, there are opportunities around river restoration with riverine woodland and wet woodland. So um, I think we, we may not as an organisation acquire any new woodland sites specifically, but I think there are certainly opportunities, particularly with wetland, wet woodland creation uh, within the area, because there are those um, there are opportunities to do that alongside some of the things we know we need around um, flood storage as well. Um, and, and then in relation to Hope Farm, um, yeah, it is, it is, there are bits of the farm that are publicly accessible. There are, um, there are footpaths that people can go around. Um, it, it's really, it was conceived by the RSPB as, um, as a site where um, 
we you know we were doing a lot of advocacy with um with progressive farmers around nature friendly farming but we really wanted to sort of test and trial things as well so so it is a pilot site um in the main but um we we like to use it as a demonstration site so um if there are ever opportunities um for people to come and visit or they want to come and see then then yeah the door is open to do that Good. And, and finally, can I just thinking, you know, on Councillor Sully Ellington's um, point about meeting up with the, the parish council, I'm just thinking about the North Stowe Town Council. If you're saying that you're kind of in those early days of putting together that Section 106 application, have you had any contact with the North Stowe? They're very new. They've just started two weeks ago, the North Stowe Town Council. No, no, we haven't. So, so, so we... We haven't heard much. So, so we put in the Section 106 request last... Um, last summer okay. um, and we haven't we haven't heard any follow-up from that although I believe there was supposed to be a, a meeting that, that ended up being postponed but um, yeah that that is a good point we could um, we'd be it'd be useful to make links with us they are they are going to be just on our doorstep so yeah good <laughs> good 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 there's Jane <laughs> hello Jane do you want to say anything oh mute sorry apologies I was just going to say we'll follow up on the point you made about section 106 at North Stowe for you, um, probably in relation to phase three, I think possibly, yes, which is going was, to yeah. be due. Yeah, so it's coming to planning committee. To, it's still on, it's still with us for consideration. It's looking to go to come to planning committee. I think in about October time, which is probably why you haven't heard um, much yet of late. But I will um, make sure that our, my colleagues in. Um, you frozen. Not on. Sorry, you just froze on us with your colleagues in, Jane. Colleagues in. Sorry, colleagues in the strategic sites team to make sure that they do keep you in, um, in the loop because it's going to planning committee in October. Good. And that's it's always really good to have some conversations with, with the local people as well, the local ward members yeah. who would be supportive of whatever the Section 106 arrangements are going to be. Councillor Wellington. I wonder if we could have a copy of the slides, please, because I couldn't quite see where I lived. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure the slides will be. Well, that's fine, Hannah. We can make the slides available. Yes, of course. Um, just let me know where to send them. Yes. So, have you been in touch with Patrick? I think. Yes. So, with Patrick Adams, I think you've been in touch with the Democratic Services. So, if you could send those, it'd be fantastic. Thank you very much for your time again, Hannah. And we're, we're looking forward to to doing more about this, making more of a Lovely. shout about this. Good. Lovely. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Bye. And so, members, we go to agenda item five, which is the Green Home Grants Local Authority Delivery Scheme update. Um, and Siobhan, hello. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so um, this update is, I'll just find it on my screen, there we are. Um, the purpose of this report is to provide an update on the delivery of the home, of home energy improvement measures to properties in South Cambridgeshire through the government's Green Home Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme. I won't go through all the details on the report that has been circulated to members, but uh, I will say that this is obviously important in terms of our, um, our climate, uh, um, providing heat and power for the 67,000 homes in South Cambridgeshire accounts for about 20% of our carbon footprint. And so we have got some actions in our zero carbon plan around this and the, the work through the Green Homes Grant LAD scheme is, um, is part of this. Um, so the, since August, the UK government has launched um, a, 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 actually a whole stream of, of, of different um, schemes, um, mainly under this Green Homes Grant label. So you will probably remember that actually the thrust of this to begin with was consumer direct vouchers. And as an authority, we um, did what we could through social media to um, make sure that our residents got the message about that and applied for those um, vouchers. They were available for households regardless of income. Unfortunately, that scheme was withdrawn uh, well before its planned end and well before the um, uh, the, the intended budget was spent. However, the local authority delivery part of the Green Homes Grant um, has, uh, the government has pushed ahead and actually, in, in fact, expanded this. And we as a council 
are um, doing doing what we can to make the most of these opportunities that are that are coming through. Um, as as we have historically, we're working through the Cambridgeshire Energy Partnership, which is uh, um, consists of all of the Cambridgeshire local authorities. Was actually set up um, uh, for to deal with the Green Deal opportunities um, under the coalition government. And so we have a memorandum of understanding with, with our partner, with our neighbouring authorities. And so the first of these Green Homes Grants, LAD scheme, Local Authority Delivery Scheme opportunities, phase one, we um, were part of a consortium bid led by Cambridge City Council um, for funding under that. that uh, that was successful, and uh, if I just look at my figures here, so we, um, it, I can't give exact figures because they were all sort of combined in a, in a, a cross Cambridgeshire bid without that detail, um, but it was approximately £500,000 for park homes in South Cambridgeshire, and we chose park homes on the advice of installers um, because with a very short delivery window, Park Homes allowed us to target the households that were eligible. So in order to be eligible, households needed to have um, an annual net uh, um, annual gross income of below £30,000 and to uh, live in a property that was DEF or G under the EPC rating. So Park Home sites are one of the few opportunities where you have several of these pro properties close by and good communication between uh, between neighbours. And so for a, a um, very short delivery uh, window, they, they, they seemed um, really good. Um, now, there were a number of delays to delivery of that scheme and um, uh, in, in, in the initial stages and also the scheme prior to that was extended. This meant that installers right across the country were under huge pressure and we ended up in a situation whereby we didn't have um, an, an installer available to deliver that. The, I, I won't go into the complications around that. I'll just cut to the current situation, which is that there have been changes in the, um, in the standards, the, the publicly available standards, the PAS um, uh, 2035, and that means that there is an ongoing doubt as to whether this can be can can still be delivered. Uh, we are continuing to explore this. If we can't deliver the fund, um, deliver as anticipated to the park homes, we will look at other possibilities in terms of other kind of households under that. That is, so that is the the first scheme. The second scheme, different type of um, delivery mechanism that is being managed by the Greater Southeast Energy Hub and E.ON are delivering that and we are meeting weekly with them and um, uh, it, we're in the process of identifying houses to be delivered under LAD2. We have an allocation from the government of £430,000 which um, will deliver between 43 and 86 properties depending on whether they are owner occupied in which case there is £10,000 per property or rented, in which case there's five thousand pounds per property. At the moment, it looks likely that those uh, that 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 allocation that we will be able to use that for our council homes. Um, but the other thing, the other areas we're looking into are um, houses that we have under our Ermine Street housing scheme, and also properties that are um, under our private leaseholder scheme, the Shire Home scheme. Um, so there are various possibilities we're looking into um, for delivery of, of LAD2, which is due to be delivered by the end of March um, next year. And then the third scheme, we have um, been again part of a consortium bid led by Cambridge City Council. And we are um, looking to do work on approximately 80 homes through that scheme. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're, we're waiting to hear from the government. We should hear fairly shortly whether that bid has been successful. Um, we will be looking at, uh, at, at how to identify privately owned housing, um, principally for, for the LAD3 three, um, three delivery. 
Um, LAD3 will include some funding for um, extra officer time, but uh, meanwhile, we also have um, a new project officer starting um, at the beginning of November, and that person will, will, be looking, um, will be looking to get that person working on this also. So that is a quick run through of uh, the Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme and our um, participation in it. Are there any questions? Or oh, happy to happy to take any questions. I have one, Siobhan. <laughs> Let's see if anybody has this. Um, so I suppose the concern is, I mean, one, this is great that we're going in through the Cambridgeshire, you know, energy partnership. Um, but if I'm just rapidly adding these up, so you know, we're looking at maybe around sort of 240, 250 homes total um, that could come out for our homes in South Cambridgeshire that are council owned or rented homes. Um, out of a total of how many would you say that need retrofitting or some kind of you know, insulation work? I don't have a figure for that, but it'll be, it'd be many, many thousands for sure. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're kind of, what I'm thinking is we're dipping our toe into the water with these, aren't we? With a huge amount of resources and effort for a few houses. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what do you think about it? Us doing this because it's, there's going to be important lessons learned about this or, um, what, what value added? You know, we can then scale out. I'm just thinking the scaling of that will obviously de be dependent on the, the, the grants that the government's giving out. But is it just because we've got a tiny percentage of the overall grant or the grants in themselves that are coming from, grant, from government are still really, really quite small, you know, in terms of scale? Um, and, and how do we best use our resources that we've got staff working really well on this, but these are, these are really tiny numbers in the end, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think it is a question of um, rolling it out and expanding it. I mean, uh, it, the, the um, uh, installer capacity is, 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 is one of the issues. I mean, our approach has been to, um, to, to put in uh, bids for the LAD1 and the LAD3 scheme, which are um, uh, the, the, the maximum that we think can be delivered um, and actually the LAD2, there was that, uh, the allocation was actually made by, by government. Um, the, the, our, we, we don't know what will happen in the future, but I think there's a reasonable likelihood that um, funding will continue to be made available. So I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure now with COP26 coming up and our, you know, the renewed government targets around climate change, this whole issue around heating in homes will have to be you know, be addressed and there will be bigger grants coming out. So I'm just wondering, as we go into these, is this enabling us to be able to, are we running ragged trying to get these small numbers of houses, or will this give us the ability to say, we've done that, we can go for the bigger, you know, once the bigger grants come online, we're able to go for them. Do you know what I mean? It's just, and that, so then the capacity, do we have for the first lad one, do we have capacity in-house to to already know from our housing audit work that Peter Matt, that Peter's leading in that um, you know which houses would be can we identify them already or we just don't have capacity to identify alternative houses for that lad one scheme if we can't use the park homes you're saying we will then identify you know can we have do we know can we know already you know which ones they are or actually that's a huge piece of work because we're still doing the audit. Yes, the, 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 lad, the LAD one, one of the things that has, I was sort of amused by you're talking of us running ragged. One of the things I think that's made us feel a bit ragged is that every one of these schemes, and there have been four because one has been 1A and 1B, um, have rather different uh, criteria and parameters. Um, so uh, the, the 1B uh, scheme uh, is, is, is not one that the council housing, I, I believe, can be, um, can, can be done under. Mm -hmm. um, so we are looking to um, private sector homes for that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. 
Um, and in terms of, um, of identifying them, we can identify um, the properties that um, need work from uh, the Energy Performance Certificate Register. Um, it, what is much more difficult is to identify the, the properties which also have households which are, who are eligible by virtue of their income. Um, and willing and, to have it so, done. So it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marketing and promotion job, basically. Uh, which we um, are really waiting to, to find out whether the park homes um, is eliminated before addressing um, how we would go about do that, doing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just, <coughs> just going to comment uh, that, that this is tying in with the uh, with rental in terms of rental homes, which I think is going to be one of the most important uh, targets for this because the government's increasing the uh, requirements for people to be able to let, let property, so they have to be uh, C grade or, or, or above from uh, 2025 or 2028 for existing tenants. So it's going to be quite a requirement for, for, for landlords, and uh, I, I would have thought there is opportunity to, to bring this attention to such landlords who are, who are considering that. I myself let four homes, uh, three of which are, are, are D, so they, I would have to spend some money on it or we thought that was sort of the problem, and it's something that's worrying me. So if it's worrying me, it's, co it's concerning other, other landlords, and uh, none of them are in this area, so I won't be affected. Um, but, the, uh, <laughs> but, but it is an issue, and a lot of, the, a lot of private rented property is older property, which therefore doesn't meet standards. Often, but not, some of it not uh, solid walls, um, needing quite significant I investments. I mean, one of the holdbacks at the moment has been the limit of 2,500, I think, in the past, about the, ma the maximum that the landlord can spend. Uh, I think that's going to be clearly going to have to go up, uh, and that may bring much more of this sort of re these measures within the, the, the scope, and you may find, but, but there will be need, I think, to publicize that and make sure that mm -hmm. landlords are aware and make sure, that, uh, basically, to, to market that uh, as an opportunity. And, and maybe that's where, when we decided to be the one council that joined that East of England energy scheme, was looking at how you, how you train up, um, you know, local companies that are doing the retrofitting as well. You know, perhaps in line with that, because we're still waiting for that to happen over the next year, aren't we? So when that happens, perhaps it's a way of then, you know, making that available to to. The as well. It's a classic problem, isn't it? Without a long-term scale, it's difficult to get the, uh, the investment in the, in, in the supply, mm. uh, suppliers. And, and there has been a stop start a lot in, in, in these sort of measures. Um, so I think you know, if one of the measures to go to higher government would be to try and get as a long-term program, isn't it, with a consistent, uh, consistent demand so you can, you can plan for it. So, so what, what I take away from this, Siobhan, is if we could look at, we've, we've talked about in our business plan about being the one one stop for businesses about greening their business. But if we look at this one stop for landlords in terms of business, you know, so enabling them to know what's coming down the line, when we do have the information from the learning that we're doing around those properties, you know, together with the, the training of those retrofitting companies, um, that's something that perhaps we can provide, you know, in the longer term to, to the landlords. Um, meanwhile, I, what I notice, you've got somebody else coming on board that can help with this, which is great, so you've got some extra capacity coming in. And I do think it's, can we have a, perhaps when somebody does come in, but perhaps a plan about, you know, what are we wanting out of this in terms of scale? What can we manage? And therefore, you know, what's the capacity we need? And then when the new person who's going to help us with looking at grants and funding we can also then know what they're trying to look for. Because as you say, I think there's going to be an avalanche of different funding schemes coming out, and we need to sort of give them some direction as well as they're looking at. So if perhaps we could sort of say, okay, what's our scale going to be with the housing order that's happening? How many do we think you know, we, we need to do? What, how can you identify, categorize them? And what kind of you know, funding do we need for that? Because I wouldn't be able to say in this moment, you know, how much do we need as a council? Actually, to do it for all our properties, how much do we need? I don't think we know we, we have a figure, but if we could get that, the person that's coming in and work with them to actually, for our action plan, have that a little bit of sort of sketched out so that when the person yeah. is looking for funding, you know, we know what we're looking for as well. Yeah, we completely agree with the need to do that. And, yeah, 
uh, we've had conversations along similar lines, haven't you, Siobhan, about, it's, you know, it's just unfortunate the way that the funding has been rolled out is that, you know, it's been a bit of an avalanche and a bit of a domino effect. Um, but now we know that this is sort of the way that things are going to pan out. <clears throat> We've got an opportunity, as you say, to um, do that bit of preparation work. So we're ready going forward, I think. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That's really good. And thank you for giving us that, that update. It's really clear insight, Siobhan. Brilliant. You've got such a way of summarising, simplifying things. It's fantastic. So thank you. Very much. We go to item number six, which is the air quality update. And is that Soraya? Are you presenting the air quality? Is that Peter as well there? Ah, good afternoon. Hello. Apologies for the delay. Uh, right. Uh, well, we are providing the committee with three reports, which are contained within the agenda. Firstly, there's the air quality ses uh, screening assessment. This was submitted to DEFRA in June 2021 and details the air quality data captured in South Canada in 2020. This will be uploaded onto the Council's website once it's confirmed by DEFRA that the report, findings and recommendations have been accepted. Secondly, we're providing an updated air quality strategy which details the Council's commitment to air quality. The strategy has three focuses, uh, one being the future growth and development, and this takes into account the predicted growth of the area, two, the monitoring network, and three, engagement with existing communities. Thirdly and finally, we provide a report following members' concerns on traffic near a school in Harston. The report was undertaken utilizing trial technology where air quality was monitored for six months. Similar studies are currently taking place using this technology in North Stow and Camborne, which coincided with Clean Air Day this year. All of these reports will be made available on the Council's website and for a discussion amongst the group. We're happy to answer any questions. Good, wonderful. Well, this, as you rightly note, this is an area of, you know, keen interest of the, of the council. And perhaps as we've sort of driven ahead with other issues within the zero carbon and the double nature strategy, we've, we've had less of an eye on this, but this is absolutely, you know, central to everything we, we think we need to be looking at as well. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all of the, the reports that we've got in our agenda pack. So first of all, I'll open out to any questions. Councillor Swellington. Um, thank you very much for this report. Uh, I found it very interesting, um, particularly as my village is quite concerned by the increase in traffic, which is using Swavesea and Fendraden as a rat run from North Stowe instead of going up to the A14 and are very concerned at the growth in traffic that way, added to a um, increase in lorry traffic from a Mick George um, refuse site, which, uh, and I wonder whether it's possible for parish councils to hire or buy um, an air quality um, uh, machine as described and and whether it or whether it has to be operated by yourselves in order to be valid good question just just to answer that query if that's okay sorry sorry you go you go ahead you. no no, no. <laughs> I insist, you go uh, thank you very much for your question that is a very good question and i'm very pleased to say that as a result of the actions we have undertaken under our quality strategy, we have now procured um, portable monitors. Uh, they're called Zephyrs. They run on uh, solar energy and they can be uh, mounted on a lamppost easily. That will enable the council to actually undertake short studies um, in areas of concern, such as the one you just mentioned. And that will be an indication for us to consider air quality and whether there is a need for long-term monitoring and if there is an immediate uh, issue to be addressed. So we have now that capacity and we are hoping to receive um, um, areas of concern, the one, such as the ones you just mentioned from members, from the public. So we will put together a priority list and we can actually commit to short studies, minimum of six months, depending on what we see uh, with the real-time data. I'll get on the list. <laughs> yes, Councillor Paul Burpark. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this report. Um, I can appreciate there's um, a great deal of work gone into this. Um, I've got a comment particularly on the air quality strategy. Um, so I read through, I read through this a couple of times, um, and it wasn't entirely clear what the objectives are for air quality within South Camps. There's a lot of discussion about improving air quality, um, but I wasn't sure. Maybe this is a question for the council and members: is um, you know what do we want to achieve? Um, obviously, there's new development in the area, so that's going to contribute to uh, pollution. Um, so it could, without without taking measures, it could get worse. Um, but we're talking about improving air quality, um, and it would be good to have some time frames and specific objectives. I think um, that we can be aiming for, and for those to feed through into the strategy. Um, and I noted also the measures that you listed. Um, I wasn't entirely clear whether some of those measures were already in, kind of in in progress, such as already implemented within the current local plan, and whether there are measures we should be considering for the new local plan. Um, so there was a bit of a, I wasn't quite clear what's, what's already underway, <laughs> and, what, and what do we need to, um, what do we need to address, um, particularly within the local plan, but maybe, maybe through other, other mechanisms as well. So I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe it's for discussion for all of us, but, um, if you've got any comments on those two things. Yes, uh, thank you. That is a very good question. And um, I'm pleased to say that this is for, uh, air quality strategy is a um, high level document for the council to actually promote um, and set our approach on how we will consider um, air quality in terms of monitoring it and improving it. A um, couple of actions that we have undertaken already in terms of review of our um, air quality monitoring network and the one that I've just mentioned with the sensors that enables us to do uh, short time studies uh, will actually help us to identify areas where there are concerns of air quality, where air pollution is close or above uh, national air quality objective that are set and we are obliged to actually meet them. If we identify, do, uh, identify do, those areas, then we will, under a separate document approach, will have an air quality action plan in which a particular set of measures, exactly the way you said, with particular measures and uh, timeline uh, will be set and um, uh, be presented to council on all of that, and we will have a weight in planning um, uh, procedures as well. So by identifying those areas at the, at the first step, we're hoping to see where we are at at the moment. Uh, the other aspect of the air quality strategy is, as you said again, is mainly to shift our focus from um, previous areas that we were concerned about, like uh, A14, and consider future growth that we are undergoing and facing, which will definitely have an impact on increase of traffic, and therefore, uh, consequently, will uh, increase our air pollution. So by considering and undertaking future monitoring district-wide, where uh, so many developments are now proposed, we are actually hoping to address that gap in our data. And uh, if we, there is a need for a set of actions and measures to be undertaken, then we have the evidence and data to um, put together that action plan and proceed the future. Peter, if you need to add anything, please go ahead. <laughs> the only thing actually I was going to add was that um, obviously air quality continues to evolve. So We'll be listening to residents, we'll be listening to members, and, and really, you know, with the Zephyrs, we, we see a great deal of potential in terms of uh, really community engagement with these uh, with these devices. And, and obviously, these things, it would be short sighted for us to say, well, we're only going to achieve this if it's a, a bottom rung of the, the ladder, effectively, when, when we see so much potential actually in, in evolving air quality and just getting that community engagement, making people aware exactly. You know, giving the consumer awareness effectively into things like wood burning stoves, we'll be doing pilots on those. 
Um, and we're looking at sort of cleaner cars and technology and, and whatever else. So, you know, we see a great deal of potential in this one. It'll, it'll be something that we'll continue to evolve. And obviously, if members want to to add to that and help us evolve the, the, the shape of the air quality strategy, then we're, we're all ears. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I suppose one of the things that I'm concerned about is that through monitoring, you only know after the event. Um, it's, it's almost that you've then got to put in kind of retrospective measures to fix it. Um, I wonder if there's a kind of more proactive approach that we could be taking, especially when it comes to new developments. And specifically, that's why I'm kind of asking about what can we do um, through the local plan, uh, the emerging, you know, the new local plan to, um, to address that. Um, and I wondered specifically on the measures that you've identified, whether you could say for each of them, this is something that we should think about for the local plan. Um, you know, perhaps there should be a policy relating to it or something, and the policy should uh, consider those things. So we're being a bit more proactive rather than monitoring, which I see as reactive, and um, providing the evidence after the pollution has got to a certain point, which you don't want it to get to. Hello, perhaps to sort of come, come in on this a bit where um, what Paul's talking about. I think what we've done on the zero carbon strategy and the doubling nature strategy has got into an area where it's almost uncomfortable by insisting we set some kind of targets as, and then we said they're aspirational targets because we don't have all of the powers and resources as, as local authorities to ensure that we can you know, insist on them, but we can let everybody know that is where we're heading for. And so Paul wasn't around when, so this is quite a big change because before the air quality strategy was just kind of maintaining because there wasn't a problem. So it was a big thing to get the improvement language in, which is in starting to say, actually, it's not an easy thing to say, actually, we do think there are areas of concern, even though the data isn't yet saying big red flags. So there's been a big shift in terms of moving to language of an objectives of improvement, which have, have then meant there's a new strategy needed because there are actions that you need to do about improvement. But I think we could take it, as you're saying, um, as, especially as this hasn't yet gone to cabinet, but you know, let's look at some of those targets. Now, I wonder, and in, in, in this goes, one of the, and as you will know it, I think, well, Peter, you'll get to know it, but so one of the concerns is, around schools. Now, all of the reports that we have here, including the Harston reports, use as reference the, the current national thresholds. We know that the World Health Authority has said there shouldn't be a threshold for PM. But we have got one. And at some point, we think that's going to change. But do we stay just behind the threshold, which in the Harston School it met, you know, 0.1, you know, it was 49 when the threshold is 50, and only on two occasions instead of 24. But actually, if we went according to WHO guidelines, that's far too much. But that's where we are in the UK with current legislation. Do we want to say, you know, in our new local plan, in new developments, where there are new schools, that we would actually want to see that, not just that the consultant says, yes, absolutely, you can keep that well below the threshold. Or do we want to say, actually, we want to see it here. You know, this is where we want to see it. Because it goes to the County Environment Committee, and the County Environment Committee looks at it and says, it's below the threshold, so it's fine. But, but the threshold is becoming increasingly undesirable, I think. And at some point it will change. And by then we've lo locked in some of our larger developments and we've locked in schools. So I, you know, do, how much of a kind of an aspirational target do we set ourselves in terms of new developments? Knowing that we can't insist on it, but we are inviting you know, developers and communities to, to try and achieve that with us. That, that would be one, one example, I think. Um, secondly, my second, question, which is around another part that we, if you remember, we did sort of insist came in, which is the issue of alignment with neighboring councils. Um, and maybe Councillor Jeff Harvey wants to sort of mention something on here, but in terms of alignment, this is also about the fact that the 
air quality within the city and our air quality inextricably linked. And the licensing of taxis and the type of taxis and the emissions from taxis is a sensitive issue and we'd come to an agreement. We know now that there's an issue that's coming to sort of the licensing committee and the taxis want to talk about how that is achieved and whether it's possible to achieve in the agreed timetable. And they're wanting to have some kind of um, delay on that. You know, our initial reaction, I think, from this committee would be, no. You know, we, we can't be pushing forward on all levels, wanting alignment, and then stepping our foot off the accelerator on, on this one that was agreed, to, how many, two years ago? Um, now, we have had COVID. There are all sorts of contexts and circumstances. But I think, as the committee, I don't know, Jeff, I, what our recommendation would be in terms of that process. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Well, I think it, it, it would be um, very disappointing if we were to, um, well, pause or, 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 or let our um, timetable for um, introduction of ultra low emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles as taxes. If we were to let that slide, particularly as um, the City Council have said they're not going to let their timetable slide, it, it, it would create um, a sort of disjointed um, local uh, kind of landscape because uh, we know that taxi drivers, you know, have, have the ability to choose whether they license with the city or, or south of Cambridge. So I think uh, it would be very regrettable um, to suddenly uh, abandon our timetable or to let it slip by. I mean, the, the, I think the taxi trade um, have, have sort of Ask for you know three three years of, of slippage. Um, I I think we've got to be very careful about that. And the other point I, I suppose we could make here is that um, although uh, perhaps the focus has been on um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know what we're talking about here is is of equal if if not more importance um, because it directly impacts the health of our residents. And uh, whereas the um, Taxi operators are saying we can't possibly afford to go uh, for ultra low emission vehicles or zero emission vehicles. Um, if that means, um, well, they have to stay with um, diesel vehicles, um, I don't think that's arguable because um, they have the alternative of um, petrol, which I, I think, um, I'm, I'm not really an expert, but I think they are significantly cleaner and actually also slightly cheaper in terms of capital cost. So I think if we were to um, insist on uh, the uh, taxi industry, uh, if they want to buy a new vehicle, at least let's ban diesel, because then that creates a situation where um, the capital cost is lower, but the running cost is higher. The attraction of diesel is lower running costs, higher capital cost. Um, that um, accentuates and increases the uh, incentive to go towards um, electric vehicles because electric vehicles um, have a much lower running cost than either of those two options. Um, so I think, yes, we really need to raise the, um, the importance of um, air quality in this whole equation, not, not just um, greenhouse gas considerations. So, and I think what our recommendation would, would be here would then be that, you know, we don't know how much you've been involved so far in any of this um, debate that's come up in front of licensing committee. Um, and we would like to recommend to um, cabinet and to the licensing committee who are, I think they're going to arrange a members workshop to look at this issue, that we have climate and environment committee members attend that and air quality officers attend that. Um, so that we've, we've got that issue strengthened there. So you know, air quality, as you say in the strategy, is in every decision that we're making, you know. Um, so that would be the second. My my third point would be um, when you were talking about um, the the ability now with the Zephyr monitors, and we have identified some schools that want to be you know to be part of that. But I do think we need to make um, a bigger issue of this. So 
what they found in a lot of research around action on climate change is if there is a public health crisis linked to the climate crisis as well. And if you talk about the co-benefits in terms of cleaner air, everyone gets it about cleaner air and people's health. And so we should make a bigger thing about the rollout of this. And, I and again, I think in the run-up to COP26. So if what we can do is look at how people are informed about the fact that if they have an area of concern, like Sue Atlas Wellington has just said, they know that that can be, you know, they can write where, we've got a particular kind of campaign around it, they write in here, you come up with the priority areas of concern, and we've got some comms around all of that too. Because this is all in the end, as Councillor Harvey's been just saying, it's, it's about the same pollutants, you know, that are coming from the same carbon sources, which will inevitably enable us to deal with the climate change. So that would be my, my third point that I'm bringing out. So the first one is about supporting Council Bear Park on the issues around some aspirational targets in there. Two, on can we, do you agree that we need to bring the air quality issue into around the licensing and would be willing to be part of that member workshop? And then three, how we can, yeah, raise the profile of, of how we're doing that rollout of the ZEPA. And Councillor Martin Khan. Yeah, it's just a comment. I, I, I agree about the point. Um, the the world uh, the the SNAP targets are probably far too uh, not strict enough in, from experience um, uh, from the evidence. And clearly, in terms of particulates, we should be looking for better targets uh, um, than, than we have. Um, there's a clear difference in some of your figures between the, 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 the remote some other remote rural areas where you had about six or seven figures. And, and, and our areas were a bit, uh, areas were a bit higher. Uh, I just wondered whether we ought to, say, um, obviously in terms of policy making, we're going to be a bit, uh, find it difficult politically to put figures higher than the, 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 the national target, which is unfortunate because we obviously have that desire. We've done it on biodiversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, can, we, we must look <laughs> to see whether we can. We must try to see what we can. But I, I just wonder whether you might also think whether special designations of areas might help in, in justify having a higher target. For instance, if a biosphere reserve is declared, but that's a, a natural area, should we therefore say that because of that we have to have a higher target? I think we ought to look at what reasons. That, that's the game of politics, you could say. But uh, I, I think it, uh, I, I well, think it is part, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, important. Uh, another issue, I mean, uh, I, I take the point about bio, uh, bio, biofuel reserves, stoves, and so on. It's interesting because. 15 years ago, these were the thing of the moment because we were trying to reduce carbon emissions. But that, that's the way things go. Um, but uh, I was interested in, in terms of, of, of traffic and whether there's any figures. Uh, I believe one of the major causes of fine particulates in traffic is actually tire wear. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and what, we're doing all the effort upon reducing the uh, pollution coming out of the pipe. Uh, is there any uh, scope for improvement in tire wear? I mean, I imagine road speed has a, 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 an impact on that, uh, and maybe different types of tires have different impact on that. Uh, first of all, what, what is the relative importance of the two? <laughs> uh, uh, and two, what, what scope is there for improvement? Over to you. <laughs> um. I've got a few points just to address. One is about the air quality strategy and absolute uh, need to consider air quality in our um, policies and um, uh, local plans. That's where we're working very closely with uh, City Council to actually have a line approach on air quality requirements for planning um, applications that come through. Um, uh, most of these are concentrated about, uh, around sustainable transport, and those examples of a few measures are included in the draft air quality strategy. That will set out the uh, high-level approach, whereas the local plan will be um, the live and ongoing uh, part of policy under which we will actually action, take the actions that we can address some of the um, issues around the transport and air quality. In terms of the um, um, targets, different targets to look at, rather than just sticking to national objectives, 
Um, that is a very good point, um, in particular about a particular matter. So by doing additional monitoring in different areas of concern, we can uh, build up a baseline data in terms of what we are looking at at the moment. And then we can work on actively how to reduce the exposure to those limits. So we can kind of focus on the percentage of the exposure um, reduction in this exposure of the limits. So that would be a different way of uh, looking at it, different way of actually working with the air quality data that we are hoping to collect um, through different air quality equipment that we have in place at the moment. Um, in terms of EV taxis, definitely um, uh, low emission taxis will benefit a lot across the district. Oh. We can hear you. Oh, no. I'll step in, I guess, because yep. <laughs> um, it looks like Sarai's screen might have just frozen. Um, in, in terms of the taxes, obviously we are supportive in, in terms of uh, this committee, and we understand and recognise the, the need of uh, clean emission vehicles for taxes. Uh, on the flip side, of course, and it'll be an interesting debate with the licensing team is that um, obviously it's been quite a, a, a troublesome couple of years really for taxi drivers and, and to make them sort of uh, potentially sort of scrap vehicles and replace them with electric vehicles. It, it might be, a, a, it's an interesting discussion, I think, and it's certainly one that we need to be part of. So I'll be emailing my colleagues in licensing to, to discuss exactly, you know, how we can feed in and implement and, and support the, the, and reflect the, the, the views of this group. Um, and that's, that's certainly something that I'll be doing as soon as, uh, as, soon as this meeting's finished. Good, fantastic. And I think what we're saying coming out of this is, you know, what everything's got to be in the balance, but in the end, climate change is is the number one priority and so we do understand conditions and so therefore if there is some kind of subject but what was being proposed we think is unacceptable and so we, we just really need to work out what what the different ways can be um, so we can go into the details of of that later if if it's possible um, I think it would be good to any comments that could be provided in writing on the strategy. Um, and I'm looking at Councillor Blair Barb, Paul Blair Park, I think he has some that could be provided. If we could look at something around a sort of an aspirational target overall, because I think that would be really, really helpful. It's not easy, but it's something that we did with each of the other of the other strategies. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, you know, in this campaign, if we look at the rollout and the campaign, so you know, when we did the thing outside um, the Camborne Primary School, and we were together, and, and well done for that, that little campaign you did. But what was really interesting is the whole thing around idling. And I think it's such an easy, you know, one, like everyone gets it, everyone understands it immediately, and it, it links in with the whole issue around how children get to school, you know, and that, that whole issue of the last, you know, that last mile. But... Um, you know, if we do have some of the, the monitors in place and we run a, a little campaign around the impacts of idling at the school, you know, front door, and they've got one of these little monitors in and the kids can do a, an assembly around it or whatever. But that, you know, dealing with issues like that, I think would be, um, would, would be key in terms of how we get the message out and how we bring people on board with us on this one. Councillor Jeff Harper. Thank you, Chair. Um, Yes, I, I just wanted to um, so say, not, notwithstanding the, the, the problem we've got at the moment with taxes, but if you look at the um, trend data in, in the, the various figures we've got in the report, it seems to be happily on a, on a downward trend. And I, I suppose, um, could, could we say that is due to um, increasing uh, standards in terms of uh, internal combustion engine design and, and the regulations controlling emissions from internal combustion engines. Um, and hopefully, as, as we move more and more towards uh, EVs, that will uh, accelerate that trend um, for emissions from vehicles to be reducing. Um, and what that's going to do is um, sort of shift the spotlight onto other sources of emissions. I mean, um, when I go for an early morning run in my village, um, which is an oil-burning village because we don't have mains gas, um, 
this is sort of way before there's any significant traffic on the road, the, the dominant sort of odour in the air is unburnt hydrocarbons from gas boilers sort of firing up to, you know, get the house warmed up in the morning. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, in terms of, um, you know, comparability, what, what sort of an issue um, emissions from domestic heating are compared with road traffic and, and how we expect that to evolve um, in, in the future. And, and also, I think it might be worth sort of studying um, in the same way as uh, internal combustion in, uh, vehicle emissions are uh, improving because of improved design. Um, and, and then you see an, an old kind of car and you can see the, the sort of diesel smoke belching out of it. And, and, and that kind of gives you an idea, well, that's probably worth a thousand uh, cars off the production line because you can actually see the stuff. Well, the same situation applies to domestic heating um, because, um, I, I mean, the, the, the worst example would be an oil-burning Argo, which is, I mean, um, even the Romans would have thought that was old-fashioned technology. It's literally um, sort of soaking a wick in oil and burning it. And um, So not only are they only 40% efficient in terms of thermal efficiency, um, they're probably creating an awful lot of soot. But I think you probably could look at the difference between, um, you know, condensing and non-condensing oil-burning boilers. If you, um, a lot of our sort of older houses probably have 40 or 50-year-old year um, pressure jet boilers installed, which I mean, it'd be interesting to know just how bad they are in terms of the emissions and the kind of particulates they produce compared with uh, road traffic. Yeah, you're on the spot there, Peter. So do you know the comparative? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, what you're doing actually is actually giving me really good ideas for future studies for the potential equipment that we've now uh, procured. So um, in answer to queries, I mean, we can sort of do studies on, on things like that. It wouldn't be that difficult, I don't think, for us to, to speak to people in building control, find out exactly who's replaced their, their boilers and who hasn't. And then if we're aware of certain villages, for example, where we think there's a, a high number of a sort of dated appliances, perhaps install the equipment there and, and sort of try and get some, some information. And also we'll be able to report that back to the, to the committee. Um, yeah, no, you, you made some very interesting points and um, Soraya's back now as well. So I don't know if Soraya's got anything else to add, but um, unfortunately I don't, I, I don't think I can necessarily give you all the, the answers today. What, what we're doing, of course, is having a, a, a discussion between us to try and find out exactly which way the council wishes to, to go with air quality. And obviously it's very committed to it, which is brilliant. And then, you know, we'll, we'll obviously feed that back over the forthcoming months and years. Yes, I do know you are very important to us. <laughs> very important area. Sarai, you were in the middle of your sentence when you got cut off. I do apologise. I've lost completely the internet connection, so uh, I do apologise for that. Um, but I'm sure you were in good hands and Peter have uh, covered uh, all the areas um, that we were talking about. But definitely um, the oil burning and domestic heating will be a very good area uh, to actually have a proper look at and conduct in studies to, to, for us to enable us to have a better understanding about the air pollution at the levels we're facing. That's a very good point. Thank you. Good. And so I have one. So even though um, Katz Harvey was talking about the, the trends sort of going downwards, I think, and I, I may have got this wrong, but I think there were a lot of caveats in there because you've, you've, you've also put the fact of the impact of COVID on a lot of this, this data. And so we've had reduced traffic. What, what is interesting are the graphs that I see where, for example, on the A14, Girton um, may have seen sort of semi-permanent changes in terms of working from home because those, you know, those figures haven't risen, whereas the Impington one, and you said it because it's a different type of junction, have gone immediately kind of up to sort of similar pre-pandemic levels. Um, and so I think we, for me, I think we've still got a bit of, we've still got to kind of watch this a little bit to see what's happening post pandemic and, and with that. And, and again, and Soraya, you, you know, this, I'm, I know that we've removed the AQMA and what that does is removes the burden of reporting, you know, which is quite a big thing. So the air quality management area was around from Girton to, um, where was it up to be beyond Histon on the A14. So it was an A14 stretch. 
and it was seen that because of NOx pollution, it was identified as a red flag area. It had an air quality management area status put on it, and then the, the monitoring happened. And what was happening with the monitoring was showing that as far as NOx was concerned, really, it wasn't, you know, it went through the time and it had successive um, years in the last few years that said, actually, there is, there's no red flag here. And DEFRA was saying, do you want to remove this because there is no red flag? At the time it was saying this, we know that we were having the A14 Improvement Program. And the A14 Improvement Program has as an objective improved air quality as one of its objectives. And as you know, there was a huge amount of local concern about the fact that even though the development consent order said there should have been six months pre-construction monitoring, monitoring throughout construction, and then two to three years post-construction, the report confirms here what we were campaigning for, this is my community, we're campaigning for is to ensure we never get to the point where we didn't meet 75% of full monitoring because then you annualize it. And this is what's happened. So despite all of the community being told, you know nothing, you don't know that you're not air quality experts, it's all fine. What the community was flagging is if you don't get on top of this, we will not get, we will not get 75% of data. And we will not be able to prove what is happening, either pre, during, or post. We're now removing the air quality management area. It's been removed. I would like us to still have an eye for that, for that community to say we are still having a very close eye on what's happening there. Even though the air quality management area has been removed, we will keep an eye on that because we know that we didn't, that Highways England never met and complied with any of the air quality condition monitoring conditions as laid out by the DCA. I can't go back to my community and say, yeah, but everything's fine. The air quality management area, in fact, has also been removed. We are in an impossible situation to say air quality is a top concern when everything that the community said they were worried about has happened. And Highways England has never been hauled up to say you have not complied with the DCA. And we haven't got the data to show whether really the air quality will be improved by the A14 improvement program, which is based on a lot of the calculations and hypotheses that you've just mentioned, that there will be improvements overall. We're already seeing it coming up to pre-pandemic levels at that junction. Um, so I, I don't know, Peter, what, but I, I'm, it will be very hard locally when the news gets out that the air quality management area has been removed and we're not doing anything else to say we will keep an eye on what's happening in that area to, to the community. Um, the Orchard Park does have a monitor, but the other community side, which is closer to the junction, um, you know, has one. I, I just want us to know, them to know that the council is looking out for this issue. Air quality is important, and we are monitoring that junction. That's my rant over. <laughs> but it's just kind of like what we say and what we do. <laughs> I fully um, understand I, about the AQMA being pulled away, yeah. but it's going to hit hard because it sends a different message. And I know that's about reporting on things. But can we say that we're, we're, we're monitoring that area? That is a very valid point, Councillor Hailings. And um, at the previous discussions that we had over this uh, previous CI meeting, which was last year, where I have put effort into um, actually con convey this message, a message within the strategy is that although we are revoking the air quality management area, we will continue monitoring along um, the A14, that particular area. But by revoking it, we are actually freeing our time and resources to just focusing on reviewing and creating a new action plan, which is the demand of DEFRA at the moment. So if we will stick to the air quality management area, then we will be subject to providing a new action plan specific for that area. Um, and that action plan is um, a very specific document that will 
convey us to a lot of stakeholders meetings. It has to go through consultation. It's a very time consuming. It will take a lot of time and resources to actually provide that. For the area that which the existing uh, evidence of the data shows, there is no longer valid for that designation. By revoking that, we are in a way helping ourselves to shift our focus and resources to change the monitor locations. We can now look at uh, properties and junctions that have been subject to change of alignments as a result of the improvement works on A14. So we can actually conduct a much more and focus monitoring uh, for that particular area without just losing sight of, on what's happening district-wide and all the major developments and new towns we will be facing quite soon. So in a way, with the air quality strategy now hopefully uh, uh, continue and will be adopted, we are now setting that approach that we will continue air, monitor, air quality even within the area that previously was known our air quality uh, management area, but we will also um, shift our focus and resources district-wide. And hopefully by collecting better and more comprehensive baseline data, we can actually identify any, identify any other hotspots where air pollution might have risen to the point that we've not been aware of. And Hopefully, it will enable us to actually have a better influence on the policies that might be needed during planning process for major development. But as you said, it's a very valid point, and we will keep an eye on that area, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I was just wondering, in terms of the Harston monitor, are you, are you in sort of communication with the local parish council and community and school around the results of, of this. It'd be really good to hear about that because that will be when we're going into the other schools as well. And do you, do you have any um, explanation for the very high peaks? Even though they weren't 24, there were two extremely high peaks. And, and that's probably why people were quite concerned about Halston anyway, why it was prioritised. But you know, what, what is it that caused those really high peaks of PM10? Unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to give you an exact reason for those peaks, except the fact there might be, it, had, it could have been associated with the um, settling time where the monitor has been actually uh, deployed, or it could have been something completely local where uh, without, um, it's not something that the monitor will pick up what I'm trying to say. So uh, I completely understand the concern. Okay, but you, it's but, very hard for you yeah. to know what it is. Yeah, okay. Exactly, exactly, because there are so many different um, issues that could, could have, it, at the end of the day, it's a sensor, it's a machine as well, so it could have been subject to some technical errors as well, which is, and it, it is a new technology, so uh, we're hoping that we can actually give it a, better chance in different areas to see whether it's something would have, uh, would be repeated, whether it is subject to different local and different conditions. Um, okay, but overall it's good news for Houston because when there's a lot of, so this is the main point, right, it's reassuring people. And especially I think around school, being able to reassure people if, if you know, the air quality is okay, but we can still take measures to make sure it continues to be okay and improve. I think that's the, the big thing, you know, it's that reassurance. Just to touch on something that Soraya uh, mentioned, actually, was um, just in regards to promotion. So the uh, the report that we've just produced is, is literally the first site is, is for SEAC. Yeah. Great. Um, very fortunate. So we will be promoting it, obviously, to Harston and Harston residents. It will be going on the council's website as well. Um, it is something that we obviously want to promote and, and make people aware of. Of, of, of what the air quality data is that, that's being collected. I just think this is this is huge, really. I just want to say thank you so much, so because to be able to, from where we were, but to be able to say in a specific area that was identified as a hotspot that responds to communities' concerns, 
We went in, here, here's the monitoring data, here's it explained. Really, that's, that's huge. So, so well done, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, so we go to agenda item seven. So thank you very much um, to both of you to the Solar Together Cambridge update. Thank you, Siobhan. Yeah, and this one's me again. Um, this is an update on the Solar Together Cambridgeshire scheme provided to the committee for, um, for review and comment. Um, the committee will remember back in June proposals for the, um, uh, the council to participate in this scheme were presented um, and we did in fact go ahead um, and participate in this uh, group buying scheme for solar PV panels and battery storage systems, uh, which is run by Dutch group buying company iChooser and it's a project led by Cambridgeshire County Council and all of the districts are involved in, in, in it. Um, so the scheme was launched in autumn. Our council's role has been to promote it and we um, funded a direct mailing and our comms team worked with members on a social media campaign which was very successful. South Cambridgeshire had uh, well over twice as many registrations of any other district um, uh, participating with uh, 605 acceptances of the quotation that um, was provided to them um, or, um, uh, for their solar PV system. Uh, the, the nearest out of interest, if you're interested, it was a city at 271. So of these 605 acceptances, uh, there is, as, as usual, there is a, a, a certain amount of dropouts as people, um, what happens is that you get your quotation, which isn't based on a survey. When the company come around and do the survey, then it's, it's, it's normal for some to, uh, to drop out. So we are expecting about 500 to complete um, through the scheme. Uh, the most recent update shows that 231 had been installed at 31st of August. Installations are behind the schedule that was originally intended, and this has been caused by COVID, of course, and also Brexit, which has uh, affected the supply chains um, for, the, for the solar PV and batteries. Um, so as two plans for a second scheme, uh, Cambridge County Council have indicated they're intending to proceed with a second scheme, and so we have accepted their offer to participate as before. And uh, the latest we've heard is that the intention is that that scheme will be launched in, in early next year. Good. And is it a very similar one? Uh, the same. It's the same one? Essentially, yes. Great. So, what uh, so it will again, ha there will be um, a reverse auction of installers. So it isn't necessarily the same installer, but it, I choose the Dutch um, um, company is again running this scheme as per um, our original contract with them was for the first scheme but allowed for the possibility of further schemes. So what would be fantastic is of some of those who've had it installed, of whom? <laughs> I know of two. <laughs> One to our, but it would be great to, to be able to show them, you know, have a couple of little interviews and film shots. I mean, there's nothing more. We did a great social media campaign, but also when we see that people have done it, in a, and I hear them talking about it, it's an even greater nudge factor, isn't it? It's a bit like the eco home. So, and well done for leading on this, Siobhan. Councillor Khan. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to comment on it. I mean, after all, my, my, my scheme has been installed. It was installed, uh, finally installed uh, on the 5th of August. Um, there were delays uh, linked into the COVID. Uh, the original date was not met and then they had to have uh, further people come in. Uh, but I've got a, a better scheme even than I, than I originally uh, planned, so I'm, I'm pleased about that. But there have been problems since, uh, and I think this is an area where my, maybe in the new scheme we could make uh, do something. And in the, in, the, in the sense of the people who are applying for this are generally not knowledgeable, on, like myself, on, on electrical matters. Um, and I, for instance, have had a, quite a difference between the readings on the uh, inverter monitoring and the, uh, the smart meters I've got. I don't know what the cause, I've still not been able to find, I've been trying to get adv technical advice. Um, there was no advice given upon how one should read these meters and how one should deal with that and how to manage it. 
Uh, and I think there is a need for that for, for, the, for the particular market we're dealing with. We're not dealing with expert, uh, experts. Uh, particularly as the scheme has now changed from fee and tariff to uh, smart energy guarantee, and that's a different scheme. Uh, with feed in tariff, you just have, you, you sold all your electricity and, uh, and, and they made an estimate about the amount that you, 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 that you, that you actually sold, but sorry, and the amount that you used. So it was all automatic. Now it's done on actual readings uh, and the co coordination of the readings and, uh, and how it works and how accurate it is matters. Uh, and people need to understand how the, the smart meters work. I mean, I, for instance, have got a difference between the reading on my, um, uh, uh, on my, um, what's it, it uh, fr from the import meter between uh, my, my, my inver uh, inverter tells me I've used four, four, four kilowatts hours from the grid. Uh, the import meter says I've used 56. Now, that's not a difference that is <laughs> a slight error. It's a problem, <laughs> and I need to know what it is. It, maybe it's normal. It's maybe one's not, I should be, I've not measured the right thing. But I don't know, and I don't understand, and there was no information given. And, and I think that it should be given an obligation to uh, make sure that adequate information is able, provided for people to manage these sort of things and understand these sort of things themselves. Okay. That's, good. that's in a piece of advice for future. Good point. <laughs> but it's a good team. I'm very pleased with it. Good point. And, and well then, Siobhan. If I could just come back on, on that, actually, Councillor, on that is extremely useful information for us. Um, and I'm just interested to know whether you communicated that to the scheme, because we, are, we, we know that there have been very few complaints through the scheme, but we haven't had that uh, individual feedback um, no. from, uh, from people. So I would, would urge you to, to I report that. Them and a I week will ago. Speak that. I contacted them a week ago and asked for, uh, they said they're going to get a technical person to come back to me. They haven't yet had to back. I reminded them this morning, I've still not heard, but yeah. I hope I will get feedback. <laughs> but um, I'll, I mean, I'll I didn't know up. whether, Thank I don't know whether to contact the uh, supply meet, uh, the supplier or, 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 or the um, actual installer, you know, whether it's the energy supplier or the installer, who I should contact and what the problem is. Uh, and it will be useful to have information about how we tackle that and when and who to see. And I can only do that if I have some sort of uh, information provided for that. So that's, in, particularly in terms of the new arrangements that have been arranged for, for sale, um, I've got a battery system, so that's absolutely relevant. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was just roughly calculating in my head, and I remember when you sort of first um, mentioned that you picked up on this as a possibility, Siobhan. And um, so I think we're talking about... Um, somewhere between two and five gigawatt hours per year um, of generation. Um, that's to really come from your initial picking up and running this. And that, so I think that's, I'm not clever enough sort of without looking it up to see how many tons of CO2 that translates into. I think it probably is quite a lot. So um, well, well done, Sean, and, and well done the committee, I think, for sort of, um, and, and everyone else who's been involved. It's, it's uh, something that, well, it may eventually have happened, but you've certainly brought it forward by a few years, so that's just great. There you are. Do you want something to put on the climate emergency? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, you one... can calculate the, you know, you got the hour of the 250, 231 hours. Yeah, we, within one month, I've had 400 kilowatt hours uh, generated, so that's, uh, I'm happy with that. <laughs> but seriously, it, perhaps that's part of those kind of calculations we need to do where we can do them you've got all the numbers, you know, put them into our, our dashboard. Great. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Well, excellent, yeah? Yeah. yeah? Good. Uh, members, now in terms of the forward plan and dates of next meeting, Siobhan, do you want to lead us on that one at all? Uh, yes, I'm just, just bringing up a document here with a list. Well, I'll, I'll, I have it on a, another piece of paper also. So mm. for the next meeting... Um, so I'll, I should perhaps just ask Patrick to um, talk about dates of the next meeting, mm. if that's all right. Well, we've got a, an emergency one coming up, haven't we? That's right. Actually, technically, the next meeting is going to be talking about the local plan, and that's um, a week tomorrow. That, that's uh, 21st. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, unfortunately, there's going to be renovations here in the council chamber, so I was hoping the committee could agree to... Uh, delaying the meeting after that in November, from the 9th of November uh, to the 23rd of November, so, uh, so that we can actually do work here, here in the chamber. We won't be able to actually hold our meeting on the 9th. 
So I was hoping the committee could agree to it. But play it by four minutes. Good. So let's take two things. So first one would be the on the twenty first. Can we just confirm and clarify? So the overview and scrutiny um, committee will be looking at the preferred options for the local plan. And we've looked at the Climate and Environment Committee also having a view on the preferred options for the local plan. Um, and what officers have you know, put forward to us is, could we have that immediately at the end of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee? So we take part in the Scrutiny and Overview Committee meeting, and then we have a section at the end. So we avoid duplication, but we do give the give the chance for specific climate environment lens on that one. Um, and those invites went out, didn't they, um, Patrick? I think, am I wrong? The scrutiny committee, I believe, is going to start at 4.30. I think the agenda has actually gone out. And as, as you said, Chair, the uh, Climate and Environment Advisory Committee will be starting as soon as that meeting is over. And I know there are many, a few climate councillors who actually sit on both committees, so it does actually make good sense for officers and uh, and councillors to do it in that way. Right, and so we've agreed, because it does make lots of common sense for it to be, but it means that we don't actually know the start time for the Climate and Environment Committee, but actually what we're doing is opening up and saying, you know, pa participate. If you're a member of Scrutiny and Review, fantastic. And, and like others like myself will, you know, join in that meeting and observe it and know, therefore, if there are any issues that haven't been picked up and will avoid duplication and bring them in at the end of it. But we don't exactly know the start time because it will depend on the end time of the overview and scrutiny committee. So it's about all the complications. I just think it is the most common sense way of dealing with it. Can't I'm free, but I know I have read in the last day that the scrutiny and overview committee was cancelled, or a scrutiny and overview committee was cancelled. Which one, but three? Yes, it was a bit confusing. There, the one before that, I think on the 14th, was being cancelled. And that was nothing to do with the local plan, but the local plan uh, scrutiny and overview committee on the full, on the twenty first is is going is going ahead. That's the one we're talking about. It's going ahead, and it will start at four thirty. So <clears throat> the uh, the one on the fourteenth, I think, was is being cancelled, but the one on the twenty first, the local plan is definitely going ahead. Thanks. Yeah, good. Thank you, Patrick and Siobhan. So uh, the, the reason I was just asking Patrick on the dates was because it has a slight influence on what is on the agenda for the next November meeting. But the five items that I have um, uh, flagged up there are the biodiversity SPD, um, an item on trees protection in the local plan, the mid-year progress report on the zero carbon and doubling nature action plans, an update on the Zero Carbon Communities Grant and Six Free Trees Scheme. An update on Net Zero Plans for Council Housing, which was um, intended for today's meeting but has had to be delayed. Uh, so those are, the, those are the additional items. Then there is the standing item, the Green Investments Update. Which, with having further with us, the, we do have a standing item, which is the Green Energy Investment Update, but with not having the officers in place, that hasn't happened at, at this meeting, but we it's one that we've put in there because we're very, very interested in you know what's happening. Yep. Um, and thank you. So in terms of I don't know if John Cornell is still on the phone on the phone on the in the meeting, but with the biodiversity SPD, that was sort of fitting in around timing of when that was going to cabinet. So would a 23rd of November miss those dates, miss those? My understanding is that it's, it's, it's okay just. It's okay just, right, <laughs> yes. If it's okay just, we trust you, Siobhan. And so we're happy for that. And well, are we happy, committee, for that to be 23rd of November rather than the 9th of November? Yep, good. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks very much, Siobhan. And on that, call it to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And John.